Um, if this time doesn't work great for you, I've gotten some feedback from parents that this is a little early uh, and, and interferes with bedtime. So I'll be sending out a survey after this to kind of just get feedback on what you'd like to see on the agenda, any recommendations on times, days. I wanna make sure that this meeting is as accessible to um, everyone as possible and, and not to say that we can't switch it around and um, try different things. So. I will set that there. Um, tonight we have uh, some fantastic guests with us. We have Emily Tatro from the Council for Court Excellence. Um, they put out a fantastic new report about the criminal justice system in DC. I will caveat this and say that I'm very biased. I um, had the pleasure of working with Council for Court Excellence uh, in my previous uh, role in, in strategic comms. And so I am a huge fan of the work they do, especially for district residents and communities. So they're going to talk about the new report they have, um, as well as some recommendations on the community level that as we're thinking about violence intervention opportunities and um, community programs for us to engage with that we can consider uh, the well researched report findings that they have. Uh, after that, we have Lashonia Thompson from Cure the Streets in the Office of the Attorney General in DC, uh, who is also going to engage with us. I think she's uh, joined previous meetings of um, ANC 5B03 and ANC 5B to talk about the program more broadly and what Cure the Streets does. But I think today we're hoping to really engage on a conversation on a micro level and figure out what which one of those programs or what opportunities they have can really be put into place by our community here um, in the next you know, couple of months. So that's what I have on the agenda. Um, after that, we're gonna have uh, some time for Q&A and any community feedback to raise any concerns that you have that maybe are not addressed here. So with that, um, Emily, I will give you, if you don't already have permission to share the screen, let me know. Um, but I think you should have. No, not yet. Not yet. Okay, here, let's try this. Uh, does that work? You should yes. have. Perfect. Okay, great. You'll just have to pass it back to me at the end. No problem. Great. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, and I have a Hard time keeping my eye on like the chat and the faces and everything while I'm presenting. So if you I'll want take care of the chat, just do it. Um, otherwise, obviously, we'll take questions and everything at the end. Um, but good evening, everyone. It's nice to meet you. My name is Emily Tatro. Um, like Prita said, I'm I'm the deputy director at the Council for Court Excellence, um, which is a nonprofit that's been around almost 40 years now in DC, doing local justice reform. Um, research, policy, education, and advocacy work. And CCE was one of um, a couple of organizations, including the National Reentry Network for Returning Citizens, that helped to staff the task force's work. So I'm here to talk to you tonight about the new report, um, which is called Jails and Justice, Our Transformation Starts Today. It is an 80-point implementation plan to invest in safe communities, and to lower DC's incarceration rate by half. It also proposes steps to regain local control over pieces of DC's criminal justice system, ending the use of federal prisons within 10 years, and creating a new non-traditional facility here in DC that would house all people still detained pretrial or sentenced to incarceration for a DC crime, um, among many other things. So before we jump into the details of the recommendations, I want to uh, give you a little bit of background on the task force's process. The task force is a 26 member independent advisory body. It was founded in 2019 and dedicated to really uh, redefining DC's approach to incarceration. It was funded um, by the city from a grant through the Office of Victim Services and Justice Grants 
And the task force focused on doing deep community engagement work, um, building citywide engagement, centering the voices of people with lived experiences, understanding community priorities, and building community-based solutions. So our task force members um, included people who had been previously incarcerated, uh, people who are, are government decision makers, academics and policy leaders, and practitioners, service providers, advocates, people who are on the ground every day. And the task force's deliberations were guided by its core values, urgency, accountability, equity, and compassion. The task force spent a lot of time talking about racism in the justice system too, um, and explicitly committed to anti-racism in its work. So you'll see where information was available, all 80 recommendations in the implementation plan detail their potential impact on DC's black population. So the work happened in two phases, um, in 2019 and in 2020. And, and in the first phase in 2019, the task force engaged 2,000 people across DC, um, maybe some of you in this room through surveys, focus groups. Um, we had you know, all kinds of community meetings, analyzed jail data, and learned from other jurisdictions. And the first report was called a framework for change. It was released in November of that year and offered 17 higher level recommendations to guide DC's reforms to its justice system policies, its correctional facilities, and its community-based investments. And then last year in phase two, the task force engaged another 500 people, continued its research, and really dug down to make those recommendations actionable in the form of an implementation plan. So task force members spent you know, dozens of hours deliberating and ultimately voted to publish this new report, Jails and Justice, Our Transformation Starts Today. It is an 80-point plan to make the community safer with specific changes that can and should be made immediately, as well as clear direction for overhauling the district's jails and justice systems in three stages over the next 10 years. The report we're hoping will be both a roadmap and a tool for us to implement specific changes to our budget, our laws, and our policies, to reduce the incarcerated population and improve the justice system in concrete measurable ways with a specific focus on ending its disproportionate negative impact on our black neighbors. And um, I want to start out just by grounding us um, in, in a little bit of history. Um, DC's criminal legal system is racist by legacy and by design. Uh, the first jail was built here in DC in 1838 on the grounds of what's actually now the National Building Museum down in Judiciary Square, if you've been. Um, it was nicknamed the Slave Pen because it was mostly used to detain alleged runaways. And that history hasn't, hasn't just disappeared, right? Even today, Black people make up 47% of DC's population, but 86% of the people we arrest, 92% of the people we have locked up in jail, and 95% of the people we send to prison. Um, we have a lot of data about who is in our jails and prisons. I'm not going to go into a ton of detail tonight um, since we don't have all night, um, but I wanted to give you a quick overview. In 2017, one in every 22 adult residents in DC was under active correctional supervision on any given day, one in 22 adults. Um, the DC's jail and prison and parole supervised release populations have been slowly, steadily declining for years following trends across the country. But our arrest and our probation rates actually started climbing back up um, five years ago in 2016. The task force, like I said, has a ton of data. What charges bring people to jail and prison? How black people are detained longer pre-trial than white people are here. Um, you know, analyses by, by race, by age, by gender. Um, I can help you find any of that information in our reports, which are all published online if, if you're interested and want help looking that up. I just want to focus on two key pieces of information today that I think might be relevant um, to, to you and to the neighborhood. Um, the first is like, why are people booked at the Department of Corrections at the jail? Um, and you can see on the slide here, the top four booking categories account for more than half of the people who go to jail in DC every year. And those are for violations um, of parole, probation, supervised release. So they broke a rule of their supervision uh, for simple assaults, for drug offenses, and for property crimes. That's half of the people that we send to jail every year. 
altogether, the top 10 categories shown up on the slide make up 85% um, of the bookings every year. And the other thing I wanted to note um, is the prevalence of serious mental illness and substance use disorders among people who are incarcerated at the DOC. A full two thirds of people who are booked into our jail every year have either a diagnosed, recorded serious mental illness, substance use disorder, or both. So throughout both phase one and phase two, like I mentioned, the task force ran focus groups, community visioning workshops, surveys online and in person that touched 2,500 DC residents over two years, uh, about 500 of whom were incarcerated either um, at DOC or in Federal Bureau of Prisons facilities when we connected with them. The task force learned an incredible amount about what community members think about safety and harm in their neighborhoods and about the failures of our current jails and justice system uh, and about their vision for DC's future. So we'll talk a little bit about community safety first. And I know this graph is a little hard to see on the slide, it's small. Um, but we broke people down by, you know, where they lived, whether they were in Ward 5, Ward 7, Ward 8, which we know are the hardest hit by crime and the most overly incarcerated neighborhoods. We looked at whether people identified as victims of crime or had been um, incarcerated themselves before. We looked at people's race and age and gender. And in the phase one community survey, um, one of the questions we asked was how much someone agreed with the statement, crime is a big problem in my neighborhood. As you can see, the people who um, feel the least safe are those who have been incarcerated and those who identify as victims of crime. We also asked people to rate the statement, incarceration is the best way to handle people who get arrested. Um, and 70% of our respondents disagreed. People really don't think that jail works. And in the focus groups, we had space to dive deeper into these community themes. Um, I suspect that they resonate with a lot of the discussions you've had in your neighborhood about safety, right? The top of the list is housing, behavioral health care, um, using transformative justice approaches, expanding the use of violence interrupters, which I'm sure is one of the things um, Shana will be talking about tonight, expanding peer support and mentoring opportunities for returning citizens at community-based organizations. In phase two, we also had the opportunity to survey people who were serving DC sentences in BOP prisons, um, specifically about their release and reentry. And we had 450 people respond, and their top concerns about coming home were getting health care, finding a job, and building community trust and support back. Uh, more than 70% of the people who answered the survey said that they were worried about those top three issues. And half who were set to be released within the next five years were also worried about getting mental health treatment. Um, and a third were worried about the access of substance use disorder treatment when they got home. In phase two, we also asked currently incarcerated people um, about whether they supported building a prison in DC and where they would prefer to serve their own sentence. And 70% of people um, did want to build a prison in DC and two thirds said that they would pref prefer to serve their sentence in, in a prison if we had one here. In our broader DC resident survey, less than 6% of respondents said that they thought the current jail was meeting our needs. Um, like I said, while people have you know, different ideas about solutions, almost everyone agrees that our current facilities aren't working. So the task force took all that it learned from our jail and prison data, from studying what works and what doesn't in other places, and from DC residents' concerns and vision, and developed this 10-year plan for transforming DC's jails and justice system. The implementation plan is divided into three stages, as you can see here, um, including you know, many changes that can and should be made immediately, and, and some, frankly, that already have been done. Um, and we're, we're happening as this report was going to print. So in stage one, we're focused on policy changes um, now through fiscal year 26, looking to um, divest from traditional criminal legal system, reinvest in community um, prevention, intervention, and reentry, decarcerating, meaning cutting our jail and prison population safely, 
um, returning local control of some of the institutions that are federalized and starting to design what a new facility here would look like. And these steps have to be taken over the next five years to reduce our incarcerated population before we begin planning for this new facility and building this new facility. Then in stage two, um, construction would start of, of the first part of the new facility. That would operate as an annex um, to CTF, which is one part of the jail system we have now, while we could knock down CDF or DC jail, which is the, which is the older, um, um, worse facility. And with it reduced incarceration levels, we can at that point begin transferring people home from BOP prisons scattered across the country. In stage three then, we would complete new facility construction, also demolish the CTF and completely end the use of BOP prisons for the first time in 30 years. This is an example of one of the 80 pieces of the implementation plan. I just wanted you to be able to see it in case you wanna look something up for yourself later. Um, the top line recommendation is, is the main point, and then that's followed by an analysis um, of the type and the size of the outcome of the recommended change, including impact on racial disparities and any other special populations we identified, um, looking at how we think we should measure the success of the recommendations implementation over time, who needs to do what when in order to make the change, and any estimated savings or cost of that change. Um, the task force you know, did, didn't have perfect information, of course, so not all of these are filled in for each recommendation, but we're continuing to collect data and research uh, to help fill in the blanks. So please reach out if you have questions about something that isn't there. I also wanna note um, for you more wonky types, um, if you're looking, this, this piece of the report doesn't contain citations. Um, it was already so long and so complex, we decided to leave those in the committee reports so if you're looking for the research and the footnotes, um, it, it is all in the committee reports and, and I can help you find any background information you're looking for there as well. I wanna run through some of the recommendations quickly um, and starting with some budget actions since it's you know about to be that time of year in DC. And many of the task force recommendations involve divesting from traditional criminal justice system functions uh, and reinvesting those funds in evidence-based programs that build community safety. So um, we know that the pandemic will make this a difficult budget year, right? But these are all actions the district can make simply by moving funding from one agency to another rather than creating new funds. So for instance, the task force recommends that DC reduce MPD's budget uh, by up to $140 million per year over five years. Um, by terminating its school safety contract, by spending less on crowd control supplies and military style equipment, and by reducing its patrol force by 25% over five years. Um, that reduction in patrol force can be done solely through attrition since fiscal year 14, between four and 10% of the sworn force leaves MPD every year. But here's the thing, we don't want to just reduce spending on MPD. This isn't about um, you know, milking their budget dry or leaving people with equipment that doesn't work. We want to also reduce their responsibilities and reduce their workload. So two of the ways the task force proposes doing this is by moving civil traffic enforcement from MPD, um, things like, you know, running stop signs and registration stickers and, 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 you know, headlights, things that don't present an immediate threat to public safety, and moving that traffic enforcement to the Department of Transportation instead. And the second proposal is to move certain emergency response away from MPD. Um, we get 60,000 911 calls a month in DC, and um, so many of them aren't emergencies that require a person to, you know, a law enforcement officer to show up with a gun. Um, and not only do they not require it, um, it, it's not necessarily a helpful response. And so we want to update our 911 and 311 systems so that calls can be triaged um, and that police and fire and EMS are not the only options for emergency response anymore, but that the Department of Behavioral Health's community response team can actually be added as a first responder and can respond to people in crisis 
um, who are likely to need or want tr a treatment intervention instead of police or in conjunction with police where the situation would require that. DC will also see savings from reducing its jail population. We spend a lot of money on keeping people um, locked up at the Department of Corrections. And the task force makes a bunch of recommendations that will lead to fewer incarcerated people at the jail and specifically reduce over-policing and over-incarceration of Black people. The um, next task that we are putting before the city is, um, you know, this, this specific decarceration at the jail. So doing things like maintaining the COVID-19 responses, responsive changes to MPD's citation release and field arrest orders um, that allowed them to detain fewer people after they arrested them, um, limiting stop and frisk, raising the age of juvenile jurisdiction in DC to 21, uh, eliminating presumptions of pretrial detention and instead of assuming that some people need to be detained before they go to trial, just requiring the judge to make an individual determination for each person. Um, setting, setting maximum probation and supervised release periods at two years and prohibiting revocations of probation and supervised release for most first time technical violations, things like failing a drug test or um, failing to meet with a with a with a um, supervision officer. There are a lot more recommendations and a lot more details in the report. Um, and I encourage you to check that out if you're interested to see how we think all of this can be accomplished. Other task force recommendations are aimed at reducing the number of people we send to prison and reducing the length of time that people stay there. Some of these recommendations include things like repealing all mandatory minimums. Um, amending DC's Second Look Act to allow people who have served at least 10 years in prison um, to ask the court for a resentencing. Expanding eligibility for good time credits and compassionate release like we did this past year when the pandemic hit. Um, and expanding work release and home confinement, which is something else that was done a lot this year, this past year, and was done successfully and safely. Um, and beginning operations of DC's clemency board. We, unlike the 50 states, have never had a clemency board in DC. Our clemency applicants always have to go um, through DOJ and through the president. And only one person that we know of in, in the history of our city has ever been granted clemency. The goal here is to reduce DC's incarcerated population by at least a third, but really by half over the next 10 years. And CCE ran projections based on our Department of Corrections and our Bureau of Prisons data, um, and then all of the task force's recommendations. And this is an absolutely feasible goal. By focusing on the whole criminal justice system, the task force was able to think really differently about what DC's detention facility needs are too. So reducing the combined jail and prison population um, to the 2,900 to 3,800 range, that would be cutting two to 3,000 people um, and bringing them home, means building a new non-traditional facility here in DC that houses both people who are pretrial and those who are serving their sentences. For the first time in 30 years, we can stop using the BOP, bring people home from all across the country to DC, and have a say over the environment and the programming that's available to them. DC, like I said, will demolish its two jails, CDF and CTF, um, in stages and, and end using the 122 prisons so that by 2030, we have one single facility left for everyone who's in, still in the system. So why am I here? <laughs> How can you help? Um, as you are keenly aware, uh, in order to change our budgets and our laws and our policies, we need our elected leadership to hear loud and clear from voters that they want to transform DC's jails and justice system. Um, we'd love to have your partnership, uh, you know, as, as a neighborhood, as individuals and in advocating for implementation of, these, of this plan. Um, this year, the task force is really focusing on their recommendations to divest from MPD and invest in the Department of Behavioral Health and the Department of Transportation. Um, we're also focused on passing better criminal records sealing and expungement laws. We have some of the most restrictive laws in the country. 
And we one in every seven adults in DC has a publicly available criminal record. It really hurts people when they're trying to apply for jobs and apply for housing, which we know people will be doing a lot of coming out of this pandemic. Um, and we don't want people's records to, to you know, be used to discriminate against them and to disproportionately hurt um, our Black neighbors. So there's actually a hearing on April 8th if you're interested in, in voicing your opinion on those bills. Um, and, and the third thing that we're really focused on this year is the local control of parole. Right now, all of those decisions are made federally. And next year, the U.S. Parole Commission will be sunsetting and D.C. will regain um, paroling authority for the first time in uh, 20 years. And we need to get ready for that. We need to figure out where we're going to house that authority and what rules we're going to put forward. The task force has a bunch of recommendations. But those are the three things that we're going to be focused on fighting for this year. Um, the other thing is that we're doing briefings like this, you know, all around the city. So if you have another organization, um, you know, your church, your virtual game night friends that could benefit from hearing this, um, please put us in touch. If you want to stay more generally updated um, on the task force's work, you can sign up for our newsletter. Um, our website is courtexcellence.org. I'll drop it in the chat in a minute. Um, and we'd also love to hear from you about what's working and what's not working in your neighborhood. Um, the task force, like I said, we talked to 25 different, 2,500 people over two years. We wanna keep that conversation going as we implement these recommendations. Um, so my um, contact information and links to the reports are on the next slide. And I will share these out um, with Frida so that she can share them with all of you. But I really appreciate your time and attention tonight. And I'm happy to help try to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Emily. This is, I feel like every time we talk, I learn so, so much. Um, I want to, I have some questions myself, but I want to give um, everyone else a chance first. If anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself, or if you're more comfortable typing your question in the chat, I can read it off for you. Um, I've also, Emily will put her contact info there. I've also linked the um, page to the full report that I think I've looked at like 20 times since I've gotten my hands on this. Um, there's also a really helpful uh, PDF that just lists out the recommendations because it's a pretty extensive report. So if you're interested in um, just kind of the tangible recommendations and things that uh, you can implement in your communities or things to think about, um, that's also there as well. Any questions before I jump in? Oh, Mr. Jackson. Oh, I don't have any questions. I'll wait until you. I, I do have questions, but I'll wait till you finish. No, 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 please, please. Oh, OK, sure. well, okay. first of all, uh, Preeti, thank you so much for uh, having this event this evening. I'm so happy that we are actually talking about what's going on in our community. And uh, your lovely guest, uh, Emily, and I've participated with LaShania and some other issues around the city. Um, and so you have some great guests tonight. So. Uh, real quickly, um, I'm really thrilled that um, this report has been uh, created and released. Uh, my major concern is that we have a number of businesses and executives who should be participating in actually helping hire people, train people, and provide uh, resources in the community. And that's always a very heavy barrier to break down. We just for some reason, we can't get that right in the city. Uh, and we have to get that right. Uh, our CEOs, our nonprofits, everyone has to really work digitally and um, urge with urgency to uh, create paths for people coming out to be prepared to have a job and have a place to live so that uh, they can be uh, incorporated back into our legal economy quickly. Uh, the second thing is that um, I'm just happy that we're at the point where we are, uh, but we, we can't um, do business as usual because we always fail. That's, that's my point. It's got to be different. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I agree. I think we've tried the status quo for a very long time. Um, and I think, you know, Emily made this point that I don't think anything is perfect, but I personally um, am willing to try something new to see how it goes. And maybe as we go down this, 
you know, if nothing else, we learn what works and what doesn't and um, can evolve and grow. Emily, one of the things that you brought up that actually um, a couple of my constituents that couldn't make it here tonight, um, but this seems to be a conversation that's happened a lot and you just gave me data points for it, which is even great. Um, but about the 911 call. So it seems right now like there's 911 and 311. And at least for me, if I think 311, I think of trash pickups or you know a car that needs to be towed, but everything outside of, of that feels like it goes to 911. And I know, I know that there's been times where even I've been like, I don't know if this is quite an emergency, but I don't know what else to do. Um, has CCE or any of uh, the folks on the task force talked about an alternative number that is still an emergency, but gets routed? Um, I think someone had mentioned 988 was floating around the city as the possibility. Um, has that come up in your conversations and, and what have you all thought about that in your research? Yeah, so um, because people are familiar with 911 and 311, we want people to be able to use those numbers, but for the operators who are picking up to make like a, you know, to have decisions um, about who's the best person to respond to that call, to be able to make, um, you know, ask questions and make educated um, referrals. So right now, and uh, it, it's not very well popularized, let me pull it off DBH's website and I'll drop it in the chat. There's actually a direct line to DBH's um, community response team, which already exists. Um, there's about 70 people on staff who are, um, you know, kind of dispatched um, out of two different centers in the city. I put dispatched in quotes because they, they're not emergency responders, right? They're just like in their cars and show up if people call them. Um, but they're a community response team that will respond if you, you know, report someone on the street who looks unwell. Um, if you see someone who looks like, you know, they they are homeless and need, need or want services, um, and and they'll show up and they'll figure it out. Um, and MPD officers can also call them directly if they're encountering someone or if they're on a call and they want a, a mental health professional to show up or they want advice on what they should do with someone. Um, but you know, that, that number, like I said, isn't widely available is never going to be something that everyone, um, has memorized. And so we want to be able to set up a triage system that will connect people with the right resources when they're calling. Is that number like a normal DC phone number or is it? Okay. Yeah. I'll find Have it. Give me one second. Or, Have you heard any talks of like a 988 or another something that's easy for folks to memorize, but that isn't 911? Is that kind of come up or not really? Not really. I think, you know, that's what 311 is supposed to be. Um, but, you know, I've had personally varying success calling them. Sometimes they will be like, oh, great, let me put you in touch with the right people. And sometimes they'll say, you need to hang up and call the cops. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I think right now it kind of depends on who picks up the phone. Um, and that's something that we can improve upon. Any other questions from people? Be shy, you can chat it. Um, perfect. So Emily put that number. I will certainly state that because I don't think I had that number. Um, you mentioned a hearing, I believe, on April 6th. What can folks do to be supportive of the recommendations that are in this report? Um, and how, how can we get involved on April 6th? So it's April 8th. I will um I can drop the hearing notice in the chat as well at link. Um, we are fighting to, you know, expand eligibility so that more people can have their records sealed more quickly. Um, in DC, even if you're arrested and you're never convicted, they drop the charges, it was the wrong person, whatever, you still can't get that off your record for years. Um, and it's just not like that anywhere else. Um, and it's not, it's not a good system. So um, if you, you know, <laughs> have some time out of your day and you want to sign up for the hearing and testify, that would be amazing. If you want to just, you know, write a quick note to the committee that says that you support this moving forward, that would be really helpful. Um, if you want to write or email um, the members of the Judiciary Committee, um, it, it's not, it's not, I live in Edgewood, so I'm also in five. Um, it's not council member McDuffie, um, but council member Allen, council member Bonds, council member Gray, council member Pinto, um, and I'm forgetting one person, council member Che, um, are on the committee and you can reach out and, and let them know. 
This legislation was originally introduced back in 2017. We had a hearing in December and it has been sitting for three years. So we're really, really trying to move it forward and finish it out this time. Right. And do you have, um, not that I need to add even more work to your plate, but do you have any type of draft letters or notices that folks can use and tailor for themselves that can use as a, a guiding document to send to um, committee members or to the the council as a whole? Yeah, we did a sign on letter at the end of um, last year trying to get people's support to get this hearing scheduled. Um, so if you give me a second, I'll link the hearing notice in the chat and I'll also link um, to that sign on letter so that people can pick the language from it. Perfect, thank you. And I will make sure to um, circulate these documents around for everyone that's on the call and may not have time to capture right now and also for our um, neighbors who were not able to join us tonight. Any other questions for Emily? Yes, I have another question. In Ward 5, uh, in particularly Brooklyn Manor and Brooklyn along the avenue, um, whether it goes all the way down to um, Woodridge going towards Merlin or whether it goes down towards uh, North Capitol Street. Uh, what kind of coverage do you feel that we are getting in these communities? Because we do have quite a bit of activity going on. Some of it is nuisance activity. Some of it is uh, really horrible violence. And there's a number of factors that we have been trying to uh, get control over for some time. And do you feel that the policies and things that you've been talking about in this report are going to help us address immediate problems that we have today, this week, and next week? So we designed this. There's 80 different recommendations, right? Some of them are can be immediately addressed, um, and some of them are going to take time. These big community investments and big shifts in bureaucracy, those aren't going to happen overnight. Um, we know that the types of investments in, in jobs and schools and healthcare, right? Like that takes time to build up. Um, but some of these things will change immediately. Um, changing the way that police interact with people and changing who shows up to emergency calls. Those are things that, that we can change very quickly. Um, you know, having avenues to release people who have served long periods of time in prison and who are changed people and who are ready to come home and are eager to give back to their communities, um, bringing those people home and, and bringing them back to these neighborhoods where they can be a positive influence, that those are going to have immediate positive impacts. Um, nothing is going to be a, a, a cure, right? Like if there was a cure, we would have we would have done that already for sure. Um, but we've we've done a lot of research, um, and we know from 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 looking at other places and from looking at, at what's working in certain neighborhoods here in DC that these will move us forward. Thank you. All right. There are no other questions. Emily, thank you so, so much for your time and for your whole team and their, uh, their hard work on this, this project. I know it was a labor of love and you put a lot of time and effort into it. So thank you. Keep up the good work. And uh, I'll make sure to send around all of these links um, as well as the report and your contact information so that everyone has it and knows how to reach you. Thank you, everyone. Ooh, and I feel like that goes right into uh, our next speaker, Shania, <laughs> who uh, I, I think is on the ground trying to implement a lot of the recommendations that Emily highlighted and to really um, give us uh, alternatives to 911 or to um, the traditional kind of MPD route. And so I'm excited to talk about what we as community members can do. Um, to start making our community safer while also supporting those who need it most. So I will leave it over to you. Um, let me know if you have slides or anything you want to share and I can give you screen sharing ability, but the floor is yours, Ms. Thompson. Thank you so much, for, Commissioner, for having me. And thank you, Emily, for that presentation. I've had the opportunity to hear it a few times now and I learned something more each time. I really appreciate the work that CCE has done on the Jails and Justice Task Force. 
I also have with me this evening Amin Bill. And I really want to take an opportunity to introduce Amin because I think he is the most informed on our team as it relates to the OAG functions. Because as you may know, OAG is responsible for a lot of different things throughout the city. And Amin has been there for a while and really understands all the other units and how to get things done around the city. And he also has been on a lot of work with DCRA throughout the city, dealing with things like um, nuisance properties and things of that nature. So I want people to know that he is on a call. He's a part of the violence reduction unit. But if you have any questions about city issues in general, as it relates to OAG and DCRA, I believe that Amin will be helpful in answering those questions. We also have Alan James on the call. He is the co-chief of the violence reduction unit. Alan has vast experience working with Cure Violence Global in other cities throughout the US. And so um, throughout his lifespan, he's been a program manager and he's done a lot of work around gun violence prevention. And so is here also to offer wisdom and any questions that you may have about national programs that actually work. Um, I did not prepare a presentation, but I appreciate the fact that when you scheduled this meeting, you specifically expressed that um, you wanted to learn about other things besides Cure the Streets, because I think in a perfect world, um, most people would like to see the Cure program in every neighborhood that needs it, in every ward throughout the district, but that doesn't seem to be likely to happen, at least not today. And so I think it's important that we talk, talk about other alternatives. Um, the first one that always comes up for me is restorative justice because um, my community work basically at the OAG started in restorative justice. I was a restorative justice facilitator and that is a philosophy or theory that can be used to address harm but can also be used for community building and trust building and relationship building and empathy building. I think that um, one of the things that these neighborhoods, and even though I'm speaking to 5BO3 right now, we're in conversations every day with different ANC commissioners who have the same issue. What can we do if we're not getting cure? What can we do if we're not gonna get the response that we think we should be getting the, the special attention, so to speak, or we won't be, if we can't be um, set aside as a priority neighborhood or as a target area, then what can we do? So I just want you guys to know that a lot of people in the district are asking this question right now. So I think that's a good thing. And I think that one goal should be to come together to discuss alternatives. Um, as I was listening to you guys, I thought about Moms Demand Action and Rachel Erzden and her activism around trying to bring public health approaches to gun violence prevention to our city. And she has been working really closely with Roger Marmet, whose son, Tarn Marmet, M-A-R-M-E-T, I may not be pronouncing it correctly. His son was murdered. His son was a social worker who worked for some at the time, so others may eat. And he was murdered as he was driving through the city and his father, Roger, is really interested in helping our city to understand um, approaches that work. He, um, when I spoke to him recently, he suggested that we actually take time to study some of these national models that are working in other cities. And I think that it will be worthwhile for this group to potentially talk to him and maybe even talk to Rachel because I just believe there's strength in numbers. Um, as I said about restorative justice, um, some of these communities, it wouldn't be, in my mind, it seems that it wouldn't be that difficult or that costly to bring in trained restorative justice facilitators, to have them to talk to the community about what it is that they believe that they need, what approaches they believe that we should be taking, but it is time consuming, right? It's not something that you can come in and do overnight. It's not a one and done. You might have to have six meetings with, within that community you may need to go out and actually go door to door and introduce yourself to individuals and invite them to those meetings. But I strongly believe in the philosophy of restorative justice. And it's not just because you can use it to address harm, but you can actually use it to build community and find out what you should be doing in these neighborhoods, determine what some of the needs are so that you can help to meet some of those needs. 
as um, Emily was talking about earlier. I think that um, I wanted to introduce, I wish I would have thought to uh, invite Keisha Bonds from the WANS office, the Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement, because yesterday when we spoke to another commissioner in Ward 8, she was very helpful on that call and she is the program manager for their violence interruption program. But one of the things that she mentioned was a neighborhood plan, which I found very interesting. I don't know much about it, but she suggested that there is a chance that the WANS office could help that neighborhood to develop a neighborhood plan. And in my thinking, they must mean bringing in someone like a restorative justice facilitator, right? To help develop strategy and talk to the people in those neighborhoods about the specific needs that they have and what they think needs to happen in order to create a safer environment. I also wanted to make sure that I mentioned our new agency, the Office of Gun Violence Prevention, and make sure I get it right, um, the Gun Violence Prevention Emergency Operations Center. So it's the GVEOC that will be headed up by Linda Harley Hopper, who is the director of gun violence prevention who came from DYRS and did great work with Clinton Lacey to help to uh, transform our juvenile justice system. And so it's a new initiative. The mayor has put $15 million behind that project. And so my hope is that pretty soon we will see a strategic plan that will involve communities like yours throughout the district that are facing problems that are sometimes leading to gun violence, even if gun violence is not prevalent in your neighborhood. Um, that's basically all I have in terms of suggestions, things that you could do outside of CURE. Um, I hope I came across clear that I think that, you know, we have to continue to mobilize. We have to continue to study. Um, we need to study the strain theory. We need to study um, these subcultural uh, theories about crime and delinquency. We need to study the broken windows theory. We need to just inform ourselves and look at the different approaches that different states throughout the U.S. have been using and see what could work for these particular neighborhoods. It won't be the same approach in every neighborhood because every neighborhood is not dealing with the same dynamics. One thing I, uh, I would like to close with is that I hope that our city can embrace the fact that if we don't deal with the culture of violence, we can spend millions of dollars, we can stand up multiple programs, and it won't make a bit of a difference. In order to deal with the culture of violence, that means we have to deal with the music and the art and the individual values that are being shared within that subculture. So um, we can't continue to overlook the influence of our local rappers. Um, as much as some people might think that sort of thing is beneath them, but it might uh, be helpful to go on YouTube and look around and see, because if you talk to most violence interrupters on the front lines and you ask them what is fueling the violence in our communities, they will probably say, the local rappers and the conflicts that they have with other individuals. They are the individuals who have the influence to help, I think, um, influence peace or to inspire violence. So those, that's all I have um, is that I think we need to continue to mobilize. We have to continue to study and, and talk to each other. Uh, like you said, this is the second time I came to this meeting. I remember the first time there were a couple, a, 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 a few, a, at least two young couples talking about how they were afraid to walk their kids in the neighborhood, afraid to push the strollers through the neighborhood. Then we have elders in some of our neighborhoods that are afraid to go to the store, afraid to you know walk to the bus stop. And um, I think it is great that we focus on those targeted neighborhoods that have been plagued by gun violence that are dealing with concentrated poverty. But I also, I am personally a proponent of supporting the whole city, supporting, um, putting cures, for lack of a better word, everywhere where they are needed in order to prevent the spread of violence or poverty or harm or whatever it may be. So I appreciate the fact that we're having these conversations about a citywide approach. Even though we are only in those six targeted areas, we care deeply about all of the neighborhoods in the district. 
and I will give Amin and Alan an opportunity to add if the, anything they may want to add. And if not, we can take questions. Um, Alan, do you have anything? Uh, thank you for uh, expanding it, the, the invitation and, and including us in it. The, uh, I'm really impressed by the breadth of this and the thinking and the research that went into it. It's um, it's broad and dynamic, uh, but I it sounds like you are aware of the fact that um, you're going to need really strong community support. You're going to need a bit of a movement style support because the headwinds are going to be steady against it. Because uh, um, it's going to be legislation, it's all kinds of things that you know this is complex. So we really have to have to sell it and, and get popular support in the communities. But I would love to get a chance to to ask more questions. I don't want to ask questions in this forum. Um, but um, thanks for inviting us again. I, I would like to get a chance to discuss this further and ask you some more questions about the task force and the test and the plan. We would love to have you be part of that that ongoing conversation. Um, Mr. Mean, I want to make sure I'm not cutting you off if you had something that you were going to add. Oh, I'm no, sorry, I, did I, if I ended in an awkward way. <laughs> no, um, I don't have much to add um, to the conversation at this time. Um, I do know, looping back around to what um, my colleague Shauna was speaking about um, with the uh, gun violence prevention um, that's been like structured right now um, and launched that um, I know that some of the areas um, in 5B, you all are like uh, Brentwood and Langdon, I'm assuming, like that, uh, proclaiming that area. Um, and so there's this initiative that they're starting, I don't know if you all um, saw the mayor, um, they're starting at the executive office of the mayor, I should say, um, Building Blocks DC. Um, is anyone aware of that? Um, and I'm gonna stick the link in the chat we and, have our, our MOCR rep, Brittany Butler, um, okay. on, so she might be able to also um, help out any, <laughs> any information okay. there. And Brittany, I'll let you expound on that um, or, you know, take over on that. But as far as I know, and I'm still, we're still learning a lot about it, as well as our role um, in the violence interruption piece. But I know, like, um, it's pretty much um, what they say was 151 of the uh, blocks in DC that had the most something is like something like 2% of the, it represents 2% of the blocks but 41% of the gun balance with um, shots fired and I know that um, a significant portion um, because you all are I believe in what MPD refers to um, as cluster 22 um, in um, 5D and I believe that there are several blocks in that area um, that you know statistically qualify and I know that it's supposed to be um, at least from what I know, like a multidisciplinary approach where you just, you know, pour resources, you have, you know, basically 24 hour act, um, coverage in these neighborhoods, um, just from a, um, a variety of agencies, um, you know, including mental and behavioral health, um, you know, even things like um, DPW, and I know Deshaun mentioned earlier, like um, DCRA, because I, you know, at least from my perspective, and I live over in Ward 8, um, that a lot of what I see, you know, there's some commonalities between violence and, you know, substandard living conditions and property conditions. And I believe, you know, not to push on that whole broken windows theory, but, you know, I see, you know, I, I see a lot of correlations. And so this is supposed to be, you know, that thing. Um, and I'll let you all, I, I stuck the slideshow in the chat um, if everyone wants, anyone wants to copy that. So, that seems to be more of the immediate future, like kind of like the big picture um, things that they're rolling out soon. So we're trying to coordinate with the executive and, you know, again, see our role, the coverage and everything like that. So, you know, I'm personally excited um, that that is launching um, and, you know, I'm gonna roll up my sleeves and do my best and give my 100% um, to be part of that. So that's all, that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. James, Amin, Ms. Thompson? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so um, 
I'm curious about the amount of time it takes to train uh, the people who are actually providing the services. I know before, and I know that that's part of you, as you're building your team out, it, it takes some period of time to um, train personnel who do this work in the communities. And it helps to have representation from people who actually live in, in some of these communities to participate in some of the work that you that you folks are doing. Um, and I'm just curious to find out if there's been any um, um, information, the results that you had from training, I don't know, 50 or 60 people over the last two or three years, where um, it may take 90 days in order to prepare people to do this kind of work? Um, are the numbers and the money and resources coming in to help do the work in the communities? Because this is a big job. We haven't done this kind of work in quite some, I don't, we've never had this kind of focus before in our communities. Um, and in Brooklyn, this is a, we have a lot of older people <laughs> like myself, but we also have younger people coming in like Preta and some of the other, other young families. And some of them have may, may not be familiar with urban living and how important it is to have consistency in terms of um, uh, people interacting in a neighborhood that are doing good productive things as opposed to folks who are doing non-productive things. So my question is, given what we've experienced over the last two or three years with the violence intervention programs and cure the street programs, are we able to recruit, train and deploy people into our neighborhoods at a consistent rate? Thank you. Well, since since my, my colleagues uh, are not saying anything right now, I'll, I was trying to talk. Uh, I'll say this: that going off mute, Alan. I was going to start and then uh, let you jump in, Alan, because I know you have a lot of experience with training throughout the nation. But I just wanted to specifically speak about DC. Sorry for the delay in my mute. I'm taking off my mute button. I can say that in DC, when we started, we started with two sites. And we expanded to six sites pretty quickly, which means that we went from 20 staff to 60 staff. So we hired about 40 staff at once. And they all went through the Cure Violence Global Training, all the VIs and outreach workers, the frontline staff, they go through a VERT training, Violence Interruption and Reduction Training, which is about 40 hours. And they also went through the restorative justice training, which was another 40 hours. And then they go through a database training, which is about 20 hours. Then the program managers and supervisors have their own training. And it's the program manager implementation training. And since I've been working on a cure model, I always see to it that every time the training comes back as a result of a turnover or new staff need to be trained, all staff always get retrained. And so I don't know if I could necessarily put a time frame on it because I think we're still in training. <laughs> I think that this is something that you're, you will constantly be growing in when you're in this work because things are constantly evolving. Um, as you said, this is not easy work. There's things like learning negotiation skills, learning how to input data, learning how to deliver your elevator pitch it has been uh, a lot. And I will let Alan speak to his experience with training since he's been here because he's done a lot of training with our staff here. And he has also implemented the case management training for our outreach workers because they carry a caseload of high risk participants and work with them to help move them towards life goals. And he was very passionate about them developing their skills to be able to do that more effectively. So for me personally, I think this is an ongoing training. I know the culture of violence inside out from on both sides. I've been on both sides of the gun and I study every day when it comes to gun violence prevention and public health approaches to solving this problem. So I, I understand your question, but I think it's really difficult to quantify the amount of training that is needed to seriously do this work. I also believe that because I'm a Washington, Washingtonian, 
and I'm directly impacted and I live in the community and my grandkids are being raised in this community, I have a sense of urgency that most people probably won't have and won't understand. And so I don't believe that um, there is an inability to scale up. I believe that there are individuals within each one of these communities who have the credibility relationship and the capacity to learn how to be violence interrupters and outreach workers. So I am very much different from some people in that I don't think, I don't believe that there should be any excuses um, when it comes to uh, whether it's searching for talent because people are out there who have potentially transformed their lives. They have the ability to learn and they want to learn. They have the passion and, and they can do it. It will take a lot of coaching a lot of work and a lot of training to get them to where we want them to be, right? They won't start out as experts, but I think this is something that can absolutely grow. And like I said, my sense of urgency, it doesn't allow me to, to make excuses. Um, I think that, you know, we have the people in our neighborhoods who can do this work and it's not going to be without the risk, right? It's not going to be without um, scary because you're talking about 60 people who were not hired because they were church boys or choir girls, right? They were hired because they come from high risk communities and they sometimes understand the norms that we're living by and, and they have transformed their lives and they understand now that it, you know, they are living examples. And so sometimes they relapse. Sometimes they decide that you know, this is not necessarily like the lifestyle for them. And that's very difficult, I think, when you're dealing with a, a, a bureaucratic system, right? Because somebody got to take the hit for that. Somebody got to be responsibility responsible for that. So if you go from 60 staff to 120 staff, you have a greater likelihood that more people could potentially relapse and more people could possibly not take to the training and, and not do well. But I think um, it's safe to say we've had more people who have committed to this work than those who have not. Thank you for that. I really appreciate right. that answer. I have nothing to add to that. Thank you, Lashana. I, I appreciate that and I, I agree. I think for this work, it's so important. And I think with a lot of nonprofit work, I think you need to hire from the community that you are serving. Um, that perspective and that insight that comes with being there is, is something that I don't think you can teach um, so thank you for, for raising that up. Are there any other questions that folks have for anyone on this team? I will ask, um, let me pull out some of the emails that I got from, from call, or neighbors who were not able to make it. Um, one question was, uh, have there been other smaller neighborhoods that have organized in a meaningful way after gun violence? And if so, what are some best practices you can share or said differently? How can our neighborhood continue to organize and do our part to prevent future acts of violence? Would love specifics. Um, and I'll say that for, for this constituent, they uh, were living near a home that had a lot of reoccurring violence and um, ultimately led to a, a, a tragic incident. But I know there was a lot of concern of feeling like the only avenue was calling the cops, which was not something they wanted to do or felt comfortable to do, but also felt like some of the other initiatives just took a lot longer. And so in those moments, you know, are there things um, you know, are there numbers that can help de-escalate? Are there things that, that can move? I understand that because so much of this is systemic, it takes a while to address a lot of these and there's so many wraparound services, but are there any best practices from any of the six sites you all are working on that we can start implementing um, kind of on our own um, or big takeaways? Well, I'll say that, um... The way our program works and the way our staff work is based on relationships. So uh, uh, if they know someone in that dwelling next door to the complaining cu uh, couple, or if they know someone who knows them, or if they have, can have a, a chain of relationship, no matter how long that chain might be, so that they can uh, engage with those folks. And then they can start to talk, talk with them about the, 
um, the damage that's being done, the harm that's being done to their neighbors, and all the other negative parts of it, and find out what what what's really going on, and see if anything can be done. But that again, as as the as the, as you said, that that takes time. It's not something that can happen quickly. Um, anything that we do on the community level pretty much will take time. And especially in, in certain cities, and Washington is one of those cities because it's a small city. Um, it's about relationships. And um, so as much as you can capitalize on relationships, there's strong possibility that you can solve a lot of problems without, um, without getting the authorities involved. But that is not to say that there's not a proper time to call the police. Because it gets to be, I mean, I don't know when that time is, but I, I'm not going to be someone who says um, that people should never do that when they are feeling unsafe. Yeah. And they've tried, and they think they've exhausted all the alternatives. The time, when the time comes, that's what people have to do. But uh, communities need to be stronger. They need to really be communities. We throw that, that word community around a lot. But um, the, the communities that actually have civic organizations, that have a center, that have leadership, uh, that can mobilize, um, that have taken on some small issues and, and succeeded in bringing about the change that they wanted and demonstrated their power and they build on that. Those are the communities that can figure out how to solve almost any problem. Um, but if we're distant from one another and very much individualized as families and as individuals, then we're gonna be less powerful. I agree. Any other questions or comments? Oh. Yes. Um, sorry. <laughs> oh, don't be. Right. I'm trying to put my video back on. There we go. So, okay. I just wanted to say I dropped a little note in the chat. Um, and one of the key things that my husband and I have found is that we say hello. You know, and wearing a mask for the last year plus, it really takes away from making eye contact and seeing your neighbors. And you really have to make a special effort to look somebody in the face and say, hey, how are you doing? Good morning. Or, you know, and that goes a long way. And I think about the incident that happened next door to us. And what concerned us as a family was there was violence. There was a home invasion, first of all, the way we saw it happen. And um, I'm not going to go into that part, but I didn't hear anybody when speaking about this incident talk about the impact on those children in that home. And to me, as a you know, I, my practice area has been child welfare. I'm not practicing in that area right now. But to me, that was crucial because they heard it all and they had to walk past bodies. And, you know, I want to know how they're doing. I want to know what happened. And knowing now that they never came to remove any of their clothing. So they just walked out of that house, some of them in handcuffs, some of the adult, all of the adults actually in handcuffs and the children. And that's what I'm concerned about because that's where the next, that's where the trauma is, is really happening. And, um, and I'm sorry, yeah, you gotta call the police, but we really have to be mindful of the depth of systemic racism anywhere, especially as it pertains to Washington, DC. And we need to be mindful of where we are and make sure we're not othering everybody else. Whenever you start othering, we are doing the implicit, you know, bias from that from that perspective. So those are so many things that that I just wanted to throw out there. And I'm sure people won't agree, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm used to that. And disagreement is not bad. 
And I really, really would love if we could just think about community events. What can we do? And one last thing, and I'll, I'll get out of the way because I know there's more to the program. Um, one of the things that I know is annoying to most people are the motorcyclists and the little, um, the dirt bike guys who ride around. It's getting warm and they're going to be riding in their packs and being quote unquote a nuisance. I don't, you know, I, I enjoy seeing it. What I'd like to find out is, couldn't we find a place where we could accommodate something like that? How about, you know, a parking lot somewhere where they could do it and have some incentive to do their tricks and we can all come out and look because those are skills. I don't have those skills. And that's something that might be a, a building block in a community to do something like that. So just wanted to throw that out there. If anybody wants to talk about doing that or block parties, call me. <laughs> I love that. I will say that I have definitely been talking with uh, some neighbors about block parties, especially as the weather is getting warmer. So uh, Ms. Taylor, I will absolutely be in touch and, and uh, need your help organizing to get neighbors out and get everyone to, um, to meet each other in person, hopefully, especially after a long year of being inside. But I wanna give a, uh, uh, Mr. James and Ms. Thompson and um, Amin an opportunity to respond if there was anything there. I think you went off mute. So I took that as a, uh, a sign that you might have something to say. Yes, I just was feeling everything you were saying, Ms. Belinda. I would love to keep in contact with you. I love your train of thought. And I just put in the chat, you made me think about Dr. Matt Beal and the work he's doing with young people to try and prevent trauma. And we, I think my team and probably everybody on the cure team as well. We all believe strongly in the notion of treating trauma, especially with very young kids. If you ask any of the people in these neighborhoods where they first learned violence, many of them will say in the home and in the community. So you are spot on. Some of them, and it always breaks my heart when they say they don't believe that they could prevent gun violence today, but they believe they could potentially prevent gun violence in the future by focusing more on young children in these neighborhoods and in these homes who are experiencing trauma that you're speaking about. So I, I just would love to keep in touch with you to talk about any activities and anything anything else you think that you may, may be doing, just get, please give my email and I'm on board. Great. Any other questions? And as always, I will um, collect contact info and make sure to disperse it. So if you do have questions later on or something that you want to take up offline, that that is available to you. Um, one last question I have is what can we um, from community level do to help support? I'm assuming a lot of this also comes down to funding. Um, how can we help expand beyond the six sites that you all are already doing great work in? What kind of things uh, can, can we do to help that along? Well, it's, um, yeah. go ahead, Lucian. Go ahead. I think Mr. James, you have, you have the floor. Well, I, I was just going to say that, um, it's, it's, um, it's a political situation. So you should make, um, uh, organize the community and make a case to your representation. Um, and, there, and all of this is, these programs, the establishment of these programs is preceded by some study and some data analysis, et cetera. Um, and then that data needs to reach a certain threshold to justify the investment, I assume. But um, that, that's the way it has to be done. Get the community organized, approach your, your council member. Uh, you might even talk to other people who you may know in philanthropy and put, get some seed money in there because they're not cheap. They're not, they're a little more expensive than perhaps they need to be, but we've established a threshold to make, uh, to, to pay living wages or as close as we can get to living wages to our workforce. So that makes it uh, substantial, but um, it, it can be done. It's, it's political. You gotta have to get the, the council behind it. And so your council member and his or her allies uh, would have to start this case before that body. But you have to back it up with data that justifies it. It needs to be a relative, 
for this particular program. There are lots of other kinds of initiatives. So every neighborhood is not the right neighborhood for this particular program. This program focuses on high violence. Um, so we're not talking about, and so e even some of the neighborhoods we're in now just are approaching that threshold. The peaks that put them in that category, but are not always in that category. But we have some that where the, where the violence is fairly constant. And that's what the program is to address. So it'll it'll take some some study, some analysis, and then and then uh, some recommendations. Love this. Well, I think we are on board. Like I said, I'm going to make sure to get this information out to others. Um, if there are times when um, you all are specifically making the case, and there's something that you would like our community to weigh in on and support, please do not hesitate to reach out to us as well, um, because we would be happy to do that. Uh, we will do that. Hey, this is Renee. Hi, Renee. I have one more uh, thought. Yes. I sent you a bunch of stuff in the chat, so thank you. For and I loved all of it. <laughs> um, I didn't want to take away from the speakers, um, but um, if you are not on the Brooklyn listserv, um, it would help to get your information out and actually spread it around to a much broader community. All politics is local. And all, you know, those are bread and butter issues. I, I've listened to all of you. I'm, I, I'm just so grateful that you have the level of passion. LaShonda, Emily, Belinda, I'm just so grateful that you, and, and Fred, you have the passion that you have. All politics is local. Um, so if you are not connected to like the Brooklyn Neighborhood Civic Association and on their um, email, the Brooklyn listserv, um, the, um, what's the other one? I'm blanking out, I'm blanking out. Howard Eastern, the, all the 5B listservs um, uh, and, and social media, all politics is local. I, I, everything I heard from you guys, I've heard from multiple people in each one of those areas. Yeah, I agree. And um, I, I will plug, I am, uh, redoing the ANC 5B website, one of the things you'll see a placeholder up there for is like a welcome to the neighborhood uh, type page where I'm gonna have all of the different community groups. Um, Mr. Tizani, I, I saw your email, so I'm gonna be following up with you on all of those, but also, um, you know, hopefully that that's gonna be a resource for anyone else that is looking, because I know it took me a while uh, to find some of the listservs when I first moved here, but they have been a great source of information and community, so. I think Thanks, Paula. I saw your chat. Anyone else have any questions? Otherwise, we do have um, Ms. Brittany Butler from the mayor's office, as well as um, Officer Kim and Officer Jordan from um, the Asian Liaison Unit, who also were going to introduce themselves and say hello. Hello. Can you? OK, yes, you can hear me. As you can see, me and my partner, we're here at work now, and I live in 5D, so I get it from both ends as being a community member of the 5th District and being a police officer for 31 years. Um, I'm more than willing, and I'm ready to roll my sleeves up and be a part of the movement. We are, we are very appreciative to have you. I will say for anyone that hasn't had the opportunity, um, I was able to meet um, both Officer Jordan, Officer Kim, as well as uh, Fred introduced me to JP, who's one of the officers that also works down there on 14th um, at Rhode Island. And I think one of the things that really resonated with me was how much they are part of the community and how, um, how well everyone responded to that. Community members, business owners, you know, to see them saying, hey, what's up and how's it going and how's your mom and how's your brother and, and really just knowing, I think it's um, Mr. James, exactly what you said is building that sense of community and getting to know people. Um, you know, these officers, at least that I've had the pleasure of meeting and working with have, have put in that time to get to know folks. And so I hope that we will be able to um, have them involved in all of these conversations because I do agree that I think it's gonna be a wraparound service where all hands on deck, and that means us as a community 
you know, mayor's office, um, the, the different government entities, but also MPD so that we can kind of work together um, cohesively towards a solution. So thank you very much officers. Um, Ms. Butler, anything for the group? Good evening, everyone. Can you guys hear and see me? Yep. Okay, thank you so much for inviting me to the meeting and thank you so much for all the pre, uh, presentations. Um, they were very resourceful, um, very educational. I definitely learned some things even though I'm at the mayor's office. So I always appreciate the knowledge being shared. Just some quick updates from the mayor's office kind of on topic to what we're talking about is there is an application that is available and it is for our returning citizens who are interested in becoming entrepreneurs or who may be interested in starting a small business. That application deadline is April 15th. And what it is, is um, it's a comprehensive kind of boot camp for them. And it's going to give them you know, the opportunity to be mentored, to meet other business owners, to help them navigate the small business website that we have here in city government so they can see what resources and grants and loans are available to them. So if you know anybody who's a returning citizen who has expressed interest in becoming a business owner or might already have a business going, but they're not sure you know, how to um, access other resources, Sources, definitely tell them about the program and you can find it on the website. It's dslbd.dc.gov and it's strictly tailored to our returning citizens. Brittany, and that app. This is really two okay. quick questions. One, can you put that website on the link? Because I heard none of it based on what, because you speak really fast. Two, <laughs> is it only returning citizens or can you be a current, current citizen? Yes, I'll drop this information in the chat. This is tailored to our returning citizens because I know somebody spoke earlier about opportunities for returning citizens. So I wanted to highlight that, that this, this is an initiative specifically tailored to them. Um, and the application deadline is April 15th. The program in itself runs from May to August, but I'll drop the website in the chat. The other, um, thing I wanted to highlight tonight kind of on brand with public safety is April is Nat National Sexual Assault Awareness Month. And there are some really good e resources and information on the National Sexual Violence Resource Center. I will drop that website as well. It's www.nsdrc.org. So if you know somebody who's a victim of sexual assault, if you are working with victims of sexual assault, this is definitely a good resource for you. I also wanted to highlight one of the- Put that in the, in, the, in the chat too, right? Yeah, I'll put that in the chat. Um, I also wanted to highlight one other thing um, surrounding safety is as you guys know, we're still in a public health emergency. Mayor Bowser has extended that public health emergency to May 20th, 2020. So right now we are in the process of loosening some restrictions, but please be aware that we are still in a public health emergency. So some of the restrictions that have been loosened up that I want to make you guys aware of is that our outdoor fitness classes can hold up to 50 people, but you have to be socially distanced. If you're in a gym setting inside, you can have a fitness class for up to 10 people, but you need to be socially distanced. In terms of our recreation centers, it's the same format. The recreation centers and playgrounds are open, but again, it's a limited number of people and you need to be socially distanced. If your recreation center in your neighborhood is being used as a vaccination site, I was told that it's not going to be open for certain recreation events while they're vaccinating the community. So please keep that in mind. I also want to let you know that movie theaters, they're going to be open, but no more than 25 people in the auditorium, socially distanced. In terms of our restaurants, because I know Brooklyn has quite a few, they have extended the, uh, they've loosened the restrictions and restaurants and liquor stores can serve alcohol up until midnight. If you are sitting in a restaurant, you can consume alcohol up until midnight. This is a change from our previous ruling where we stopped at 10 p.m. So you have an extra two hours now. I know some of our businesses are happy to hear that. So I just wanted to express that to you if you are going out patronizing some of the local businesses. Does anybody have any questions? Also with the vaccine and then I'll shut up, I promise. If you know any seniors who are homebound or if you know any persons who are homebound because of certain medical issues, please send me their contact information. We are working on an initiative right now. I don't have any details yet because we're still working out 
but to get our homebound seniors and our homebound people vaccinated. So if you know anybody who's homebound and wants to get the vaccine, please reach out to me. For everybody else who's interested in the vaccine, please go on to vaccinate.dc.gov to pre-register. The pre-registration process has been moving. It's not when you pre-register, it's just based on your party zip code, where you work, if you're an essential worker and your medical status. That's how they pick people for available appointments. It's not- The so oh, is still in the phase mode, right? Yes, we're in a phase mode, but I, I don't want people to think, oh, because they pre-registered on Sunday, they're going to get an appointment for, before somebody who pre-registered on Tuesday. You still have to meet certain criteria. Gotcha. All right. Thank you guys so much for your time. I'm going to drop this information in the chat. Thank you, Ms. Butler. And thank you, Shona, Allen, uh, or Mr. Al Mr. James, uh, Mr. Amin, thank you so much for being here as well as for Officer Kim and Officer Jordan. Um, really appreciate you taking the time to, to join us and to talk about these programs. Um, I will, as a reminder, make sure that I share out your contact information as well as the resources. I've been taking uh, lots of notes as well as this uh, is recorded. So I'll make sure to get all of this out so people can um, follow up with you. Thank Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Of course. Thank you, Have a good evening. You too. So now I just want to, I know we are over time and I apologize, but if uh, anyone has any community announcements, anything they want to bring up, this is kind of an open forum opportunity. Um, would love to hear from you. Yeah, you ready? Wow, that was that was easy. <laughs> <laughs> I um actually really quickly, yeah, I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Philip, um, and I, my husband and I, we moved into this single member district in uh, December, and I'm just trying to get um, kind of up to speed on everything going on in the neighborhood and community. And I just want to extend my appreciation for these really um, helpful and important presentations you arranged for us and um i just want to thank you for 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 that oh, thank you so, for so welcome to the neighborhood philip i have one quick question yes did you call us a gold member district i, I said single member or <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I like but, but gold I, I think it is a gold <laughs> 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 Welcome to the neighborhood, Philip. Welcome, Philip. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Renee. It was nice to nice to meet you. You can call me Renee. I'm not that old. Okay. <laughs> my my neighbor is is also a Miss Miss Renee. So. Okay. If it makes you feel more comfortable, Miss Renee is fine. Renee is great. I'm happy to call you Renee. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. As well, if I found your email, I'll make sure to connect with you offline. Um, kind of give you the contact info for folks, the uh, Brooklyn Farmers Market, BNCA, which Renee and Fred are both a part of um, and very active. Uh, I will say that both of them have been incredibly warm welcoming committees for me um, and longtime residents that seem to know everybody. I was walking with Mr. Jackson the other day and the amount of times people stopped us to say hello was uh, incredible. So um, you are in good hands, but hopefully, especially as it gets warmer, we'll be able to get everyone out um, and, and around in person. So welcome. I, 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 nice Real to meet you. I say hello to everybody. It's great. I, I, do, I do too. <laughs> even if, even if I have a mask on, I do too. But, um, one thing I did want to, uh, mention was, uh, just sort of wondering how to get involved in some of the committees. Um, you know, something that I'm very mm. passionate about is, Good. um, it just kind of, how we can solve some of these problems we're seeing that, that were raised on this um, you know, meeting today. Another one I care a lot about is affordable housing and just how, how can we be good, kind of good citizens to our, our city and kind of supporting some of the mayor's goals and kind of expanding affordable housing. Um, it's, it's obviously a big problem. And um, I was made aware that there's maybe some kind of or organization around um, some of what uh, Howard University's site in our neighborhood may be considering. And I certainly know there are probably neighbors that are, are skeptical of, of maybe some of those plans, but I, if there's any way I could participate in a conversation about just ways we can be good neighbors to Howard University and 
have a dialogue with them over opportunities for more affordable housing in this area. Um, that's an issue I'm very passionate about and would love to, to contribute. Hey, Frida, to is Howard University Eastern Michigan Park on this? It is not. However, yeah. what you brought up was a perfect segue um, and, and we'll welcome anyone's input and thoughts because tomorrow night we are actually voting. Um, so Philip, I'm not sure how much of this uh, you are aware of, both Fred and Renee and, and some others were on our um, call last week for the full 5B where this came up as well as a meeting last night where it got a little heated. Um, but oh, no. there is a <laughs> resolution about um, uh, some proposed uh, land use map amendments that are in the comp plan um, and so we tabled the vote last week because we unfortunately did not get the resolution until a matter of hours before the vote. Um, so that is coming up for vote tomorrow. Um, it is gonna be public, although I think all we are doing is literally joining it to vote. So I'm not sure that so much of the conversation will be hap uh, happening tomorrow, right. but um, I will share all that information as well if anyone would like to join. Um, but would love to hear feedback. I will say I joined the 5V02 community meeting yesterday um, and preface all of this with, I am not a zoning expert. Um, I have tried to have conversations with everyone, um, folks from the Howard East neighbors community that um, has put out a petition um, and were involved in the writing of the resolution, as well as I talked to some folks from the Office of Planning and um, Allison from the Office of Zoning to kind of say, hey, break this down for me. So try to you know, really seek out information as much as possible. From what I can tell, um, and open this up to anyone if, if I'm misunderstanding, um, there are some concerns about the updates to the land use map. However, the resolution in front of us at the moment, from what I could tell, has a lot of misinformation. Kind of at the at the the baseline, I think there were some flyers going around about this would increase property taxes. This would um, hasn't had an environmental study. Um, hasn't had, uh, trying to go through the list. And so I kind of ran through one of these one by one. From what I understand um, in my conversations with Zoning and OP, um, the land use map is where it's a visionary document where the city thinks that there are the most growth opportunities, um, but that is entirely separate from zoning. So it does not change the zoning laws at all, um, nor does it, I think one of the other claims that was made in, in the resolution, um, is that if the land use map changes, that it means that uh, the developers don't have to go through A and C, they don't have to go through zoning. I think the terminology was um, uh, uh, was it the right of right to build or, or something. I'm getting that terminology wrong, but um, that is also not correct according to zoning. Uh, I also talked to Mr. McDuffie's um, liaison on this, so. It is, it is one of those things where it is a primer. So it does suggest that the city has identified this as a potential location for, I think in this case, moderate use um, or moderate density development is possible. It does not give a green light to developers. It does not automatically mean that it will be um, huge multi-use buildings. It just means that um, it is possible in the future that it, it could be looked at for that, um, but they, all of the entities have, have told me that um, they can guarantee it does not change any of the zoning laws. So all of the process would be the same if they wanted to do a, um, a PUD or any type of high density building, they would still have to go before the zoning board. They'd still have to go to the um, ANC to ask for support. They'd still have to go through the community. So I know that that, from what I can tell that resolution in front of me is the biggest concern is leaving out the community voice in that decision. Um, so that seems to be, I'm not, I've tried to kind of call different people and see where that misinformation came from and I haven't been able to get it there, but um, you know, I, I, I wanna put that out there <laughs> so that it seems like the open part of the comp plan was last year, deadline for ANC to submit a comment was February 14th, 2020. Um, ANC 5B, the Howard East neighbors and um, the BNCA all did submit comment um, about that land use. And so that was all noted and Office of Planning did respond to that. So I can also share out the responses. I don't know if everyone saw those as well, um, but that's kind of where we are in Howard East. I'll say from what I have seen, 
the resolutions in front of us, but there's not really anything moving on the Office of Planning side. Um, the city is taking up the vote on just the overall comprehensive plan. Um, so that is coming forth, but that the, the land use map piece of it was already decided from what I have gathered. So I'll put that. Thank you. So for... Frida, just send you and fill up the Howard East neighborhood Gmail. Thank you. So that if there's something you're, you know, you can get, if... get a data dump. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. And, yeah. and that's and that's that's sort of why I, I kind of prefaced it by saying I just want to kind of be a part of whatever these committees are because I, I expect this is a conversation. I may have a different point of view. I think it's normal if you're a neighbor to think, oh, I don't really want another apartment nearby. But I mean, when we're dealing with just people that cannot afford to live in Washington, it, it just seems like such an important human charge of us to really look everywhere we can, including our own neighborhoods and say, what can we really do here to, to be helpful and, and move the needle? And so you know, there's going to be disagreements. Some people, you know, don't want it. But also, Howard University is just such a such an important institution in Washington. You know, um, my neighbors across the street, the Quanders, you know, a proud Howard alum. And you know, if th if this institution is looking to think of ways to use land that it has in 2021 that meet the needs of Howard while also advancing some of these goals. I would just want to make sure I'm a part of a community that is a good partner to Howard University and is kind of really showing, you know, that, that we want to work together to achieve common goals rather than fight and be, you know, sort of litigious and throw up barriers. You know, I, I just would, would not want to our, our community to sort of be viewed that way um, by Howard. And I, I will say, you know, from a personal standpoint, um, I, I fell in love with Brooklyn. I got married at the St. Francis Monastery and driving back and forth, just fell in love with the neighborhood and honestly didn't think there was ever going to be an opportunity for me to afford to live here, but managed to scrimp and save and, and did. And I am so glad that I'm part of this community and the amazing neighbors. <laughs> so my, my, my goal is if we can add more neighbors, the more neighbors, the better. I think that's really what got me about this is, is how um, warm and welcoming everyone is, uh, like Ms. Renee. Uh, but, um, you know, so so in my personal opinion, the more the merrier, the more people that we can have to be part of and experience beautiful community that we, you know, are, are building and that has been built and that um, has welcomed us with open arms. I would like to, to be part of that welcoming committee. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of, but I, I am here as an elected representative of you all. So if anyone has uh, different thoughts or feelings or things that you want to discuss, please um, don't hesitate to bring that up with me because uh, I am here in an official capacity <laughs> as your voice, so. Well, I would like to add something to that. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm a native Brooklander and um, I like the look and feel of the neighborhood. Um, there have been changes that I feel comfortable with because they have been incremental over a period of time. But I feel that we're getting to a situation now where we have so much development that's going on uh, with, with um, Brooklyn Manor. We have um, Union Market. We have 4th and Rhode Island Avenue. Uh, we've already seen some development at St. Joseph's site. And then when you start thinking about traffic in this geography, uh, it creates a lot of problems, especially for families. So um, what I like about our community is, is it can be safe if our streets are safe. If you have little kids who wanna ride their tricycles or bicycles or moms wanna stroll up and down our streets, when you start bringing density in an area of five B, C and D, you quickly run out of safety, okay? So I'm just saying that to say that 
um, we have to be very careful because for-profit organizations, they focus on making profit. And um, the law firms are all in cahoots with the developers to build as much as they can. And they may not live in Brooklyn. They may live in, um, in Chevy Chase or in Bethesda. And if you look at what's going on in Bethesda right now, it's very scary <laughs> what they've done to a beautiful community. When parents want to get around to go to soccer games and get their kids moving around to different activities. So I would just say we have to be careful um, to realize that once you start building on something like that land, it's gone. You don't get that back. And that's all I have to say. <laughs> I, I appreciate your perspective uh, always, Mr. Jackson. I think it's it's always good for you to come to the table and and um, and share that. So thank you. You're welcome. I'm trying to help. I, you always are. <laughs> <laughs> we are happy to have it. Anyone else before we, anything else that folks wanna raise? Um, I am hoping to be able to have these at a regular cadence. Um, but I will, as I mentioned at the start of this, for anyone that wasn't on, I'm gonna send out a survey, just kind of a general, what are issues that are important to you? What times work for you? What do you want out of these meetings? Um, feel free to forward it to others that I may not have the emails for. I'm kind of starting fresh with my email list. Um, I'm bugging Henry, so maybe I, I might be able to get his email list at some point, but right now um, I'm starting clean. Mr. Jackson, the list that you sent is incredibly helpful with that, but um, you know, feel free to forward this on. Uh, as many folks that are interested in weighing in, I really want to make sure that this time we spend is useful for everybody. So, Good job. You've done wonderful. It's beautiful. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, Thank you very much. Great conversation. Good. Really good. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Have a wonderful evening and I will talk to you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good evening. Take care.